Hello, BookTube, and welcome back to Nonfiction November. This is a BookTube event created by Olive, uh, at a book Olive, designed to celebrate the reading of nonfiction. To read some if you read none, to read more if you read some, <laughs> and, and to divest nonfiction of its unfair characterization as dry and boring schoolwork. <laughs> I love that, absolutely love it. I've been participating in Nonfiction November the whole time. And also my own version of Nonfiction November Forever. I, I love reading nonfiction and I love uh, proselytizing it to others. And I, you'd think if the, because those things are true, I would make more Nonfiction November videos, but I have not. I'm going to try to fix that. I'm going to try to fix that in these upcoming days, these, this last week of Nonfiction November. Uh, but I have been reading it, doing a huge amount of rereading. There's a huge amount of nonfiction that I have to read for critical purposes anyway. Nonfiction releases are still happening in November and in early December, so I have to read those. But I've also been rereading things and letting that reread take me on a bit of a journey. And one place where that journey took me was a concentration on William Hazlitt, on the great, the great poet and essayist William Hazlitt. And I was wondering, this was this was a while ago. This is a, this is an older concentration. I've, my nonfiction November reading has gone on from here, but I will be making videos to catch you up. But I wondered at the time if that reading of Hazlitt might not push me towards A.C. Bradley, who often mentions Hazlitt and often disagrees with him. Uh, Bradley was uh, the University Don, a uh, uh, wonderful thinker and raconteur on literature, a scrupulous writer of really, really good prose, and is most famous for his book Shakespearean Tragedy, which digs into mainly into the four, what he did more than anybody to codify as the four great Shakespeare tragedies, Hamlet, Lear, Othello, and Macbeth. I've always disagreed with that quartet. <laughs> I've always disagreed with Othello being included in there. It's a weird, and I think almost totally ineffective poem or play. But Bradley wrote about those in his book, and Shakespearean tragedy, the book, took off, uh, just took off. It became a massive success. It's had God only knows how many editions. I don't even know how many editions of it I myself have had. And it finally ended up in the Penguin Classic line, which is great because it deserves to be there. It is absolutely terrific. John Bailey does the introduction to this edition and rightly situates the, the real reading pleasure of Shakespearean tragedy. If you're not a student, I would imagine that 90% of the people who've read this in its print history have been students because it's it was often assigned in schools. But Bailey points out that if, if you're not a student, if you're just a general purpose reader and you read this, the main thing you're going to love about it is not Bradley's pedantism. He is not being as, as much of a pedant as he is satirized as being. How many children had Lady Macbeth? That sort of thing is a satir it's a satirization of Bradley. Uh, he's not really being that way. The reason that he seems that way is because, as Bailey points out, and other people have pointed out, he takes uh, Shakespeare's characters not as characters in fiction, in a novel, which he's often, mis I think, mistakenly accused of doing, but as characters in real life, as real people, which is, when you think about it, the highest compliment that you could play to Shakespeare. Uh, I think that's what gives Shakespeare in tragedy its immense rereadability. Is that you really can find something new in this book all the time. But that's not what we're talking about today. That, uh, it turns out that reading about Hazlitt did send me back to A.C. Bradley, but I mainly went back to this. Another book of his that is not in the Penguin Classic line, and that's a shame. It should be. It should be. I'm not, I'm not going to be pie in the sky enough to hope for a collected A.C. Bradley, a big, fat volume that would be in Penguin. That would be incredible. That would be absolutely incredible. But in the meantime... You have to hunt elsewhere for this volume. This is Oxford Lectures on Poetry. Bradley Bradley gave lectures. They were standing room only. They, he would often draw applause at the end of them. This is just a batter old mass market paperback. I don't see this as often as I used to. Uh, and I don't think it's currently in print. Could be wrong about that, but I don't, I don't think so. And this is a, a collection of pieces, some of which are on Shakespeare. So at the very least, they ought to be in a Bradley volume of collected writings on Shakespeare, but they aren't. Uh, we have Poetry for Poetry's Sake, The Sublime, Hegel's Theory of Tragedy, an essay on Wordsworth, uh, an essay on Shelley's view of poetry, uh, The Long Poem in the Age of Wordsworth, The Letters of Keats, The Rejection of Falstaff. So when, when young Prince Hal rejects Falstaff and it breaks his heart. The whole, whole essay on that. Uh, 
Shakespeare's Anthony and Cleopatra, Shakespeare the Man, and Shakespeare's Theater and Audience. So quite a bit on Shakespeare. But that's not what I'm reading. I reread this whole thing for Nonfiction November, but and I marked the hell out of it again. I, I don't know that this is an ebook either. Uh, but the, the thing, I read the whole thing, but I concentrated more on a subject in poetry that is lurking closer and closer to me. Uh, I recently, in, in the course of this channel, I've made considered rereadings of a couple of poets, about three or four poets, and there are always others thronging on, you know, on the periphery. And one of the ones that is thronging on the periphery that I don't think I can escape, I, I think I must grapple with this poet who I do not like, whose works I've always thought were boring, especially his most famous work. Uh, and that poet is Wordsworth, William Wordsworth. And uh, so I admit, I read this whole thing, but I gravitated towards the essay on Wordsworth, which is brilliant. It's not the most brilliant thing in here. I honestly think the Shakespeare writing is more brilliant. I think Bradley had the gift for writing about Shakespeare like no one other than Keats. So, it's it, but it still talked to me. It spoke specifically to me because I think Wordsworth is in my future. <laughs> God help me. Uh, now, I want to read you uh, just a bit uh, where he's, he's talking about the famous ode and he writes, whether or how these experiences, the ones recounted in the ode, uh, afford intimations of immortality is not the question here, but it will never do to dismiss them so airily as Arnold did. That's Matthew Arnold, another critic, because Bradley goes after critics, not in a mean-spirited way, but he, when he disagrees with them, especially if he thinks they're influential, he lets them have it. Uh, without them, Wordsworth is not Wordsworth. The most striking recollection of his childhood have not, in all cases, this manifest affinity to the ode, but whenever the visionary feeling appears in them, and it appears in many, this affinity is still traceable. There is, for instance, in the prelude, that's headed my way, that's the freight train that's headed my way, uh, the description of a crag from which, on a wild, dark day, the boy watched eagerly the two highways below for the ponies that were coming to take him home for the holidays. It is too long to quote, but every reader of it will, will, will remember, and then he quotes a particular section from that poem. The prelude is a very long poem that Wordsworth just couldn't leave alone, and no one, would, no reader would know it today, so it's, it shows you how things have changed in a hundred years. Uh, I might as well read the, the little passage that he quotes. The wind and steely rain and all the business of the elements, the single sheep and the one blasted tree and the bleak music from that old stone wall, the noise of wood and water, and the mist that on the line of each of those two roads advanced in such indisputable shapes. Okay, all right. The music of a stone wall is really good, and the fact that the poet is referring to indisputable shapes while also disputing them is also something I would not have seen 30 years ago. It's possible that Wordsworth knows what he's doing and that Steve did not when it comes to poetry. It's possible that my reread of Wordsworth will yield a lot. <laughs> uh, but then, then, we, then Bradley goes on. And the, this first line is brilliant. Bradley tosses off these lines of sheer brilliance easily. He's not showboating. There are other writers who do showboat when they do stuff like this. He's not one of them. Uh, everything here is natural, but everything is apocalyptic. Marvelous. And we happen to know why. Wordsworth is describing the scene in the light of memory. In that eagerly expected holiday, his father died, and the scene, as he recalled it, was charged with the sense of contrast between the narrow world of common pleasures and the blind and easy hopes, and the vast unseen world which encloses it in beneficent yet dark and inexorable arms. The visionary feeling has here a peculiar tone, but always, openly or covertly, it is the intimation of something illimitable ever arching and breaking into customary reality in its char its character varies and so sometimes as it touch as it's touched the soul suddenly conscious of its own infinity melts in rapture into that infinite being while at other times the mortal nature stands dumb incapable of thought or shrinking from some presence this feeling is so essential to many of wordsworth's most characteristic poems that it may almost be called their soul and failure to understand them frequently arises from obtuseness to it and there you have a little bit of a, a little bit of a defect on Bradley's part, which is which comes up often in Shakespearean tragedy, but it comes up often in this collection too. His his hint that if you don't see what he's pointing at, 
you're a blockhead. <laughs> the, the reason people don't see the particular interpretation I'm giving to this particular aspect of Wordsworth's poetry might be because they're obtuse. <laughs> okay, all right, Professor, calm down. <laughs> but before I go, before I before I stop talking about about uh, Oxford lectures on poetry, um, and there is Wordsworth on the cover, of course, so we didn't put Shakespeare on the cover for this one. Uh, I want to read a little bit about him on Shakespeare. I, I won't do a lot, but that that essay on the rejection of Falstaff is amazing. That moment. In the, re the rejection of Falstaff in the play is marvelous. It's one of the only times when Falstaff stops. Just stops. He's accustomed to taking things and just rolling them into bigger things, always under his own command, and that moment just stops him. Uh, it's beautifully done in a conglomerate kind of borrowing from here and there in the Branagh, Henry V. Uh, it's, it, he, he takes from other things and bits and pieces, and boy, oh boy, does it work. Robbie Coltrane as Falstaff. Yeah, boy, oh boy. But I want to read you a little bit about uh, Bradley on uh, Henry V. Uh, uh, to come then to Henry. <laughs> Both as prince and as king, he is deservedly a favorite, and particularly so with the English readers, being as he is perhaps the most distinctively English of all Shakespeare's men. In Henry V, he is treated as a national hero. In this play, he has lost much of the wit, which in him seems to have depend, depended on contact with Falstaff. I would never have thought that before reading this. Uh, but he has also laid aside the most serious faults of his youth. He inspires in a high degree fear, enthusiasm, and affection. Thanks to his beautiful modesty, he has the charm which is lacking to another mighty warrior, Coriolanus. His youthful escapades have given him an understanding of simple folk and sympathy with them. He is the author of the saying, there is some soul of goodness in things evil. And he is much more obviously religious than most of Shakespeare's heroes. Having these and other fine qualities and being without certain dangerous tendencies which mark the tragic heroes, he is perhaps the most efficient character drawn by Shakespeare, unless we count Ulysses from Troilus and Cressida as his equal. See what I mean? One of the joys of reading about actually any any thoroughly Shakespeare-soaked writer, but especially Bradley, is that he knows the whole sphere of what he's talking about and can pull comparisons from everywhere. And they spark. They, they throw off sparks. It's amazing. Uh, and so he has been described as Shakespeare's ideal man of action. Nay, it has even been declared that here for once Shakespeare plainly disclosed his own ethical creed and showed us his ideal not simply of a man of action, but of a man. And it goes on like that. Page after page, you just don't want it to end. I should actually check to see if Project Gutenberg has Bradley. It's possible that they do. I mean, these, these lectures were done, well, this book, this book was done in 1909. Okay, so Project Gutenberg will have this. I should check and see. Uh, but I don't, certainly I should check and see because this old paperback is not going to last much longer. I've gone at this a million times. I love it so much. Uh, but uh, that is my nonfiction November for today. It's A.C. Bradley, of all people. I have no idea where this will take me next. Maybe it won't take me anywhere. Maybe I'll just pick a nonfiction out of the blue. <laughs> but I wanted, to I wanted to touch on this at least a little because I've been letting the ball drop with nonfiction November. I am moving on. So I will wrap this up for now and I will see you then. Thank you, Booktube.